Welcome, everybody. This is the U.S. Great Sports Podcast. I'm Doug Barry, along with my always very good friend, Father Richard Heilman. He's wearing a very special jersey today, a custom-made U.S. Great Sports number 64. That was your high school number, Father? That was my high school number. It took uh, Jerry Kramer's number from the Green Bay Packers. Nice, nice. Still a Packer yep. fan. Yeah. Imagine that. Yeah. I know. You can't do anything without him. Our guest tonight, Jason Jones. We're going to be talking about the film Doomed to Repeat It, which is finally out. At the time we released this on Wednesday, July 6th, the film has been out for one day. It came out on July 5th. But before we get started, of course, everything begins with prayer. And Father Heilman, again, we always turn that over to you. Sure. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our defense against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you very much, Father. And thank you, everybody who supports the U.S. Grace First podcast with your prayers. Of course, your encouragement. I can't thank you enough for that. Those who support us with your sacrifices and especially those who support us through the Patreon program. That is an enormous way to help us right now. Uh, we just were banned from YouTube for four months. This episode is back on YouTube, and we're not sure how long it's going to last considering the topic <laughs> we'll be discussing tonight, but we're going to give it a shot and see how well it goes. But thank you, everybody who supports us to the Patreon program. If you're interested in helping us, you can contribute. Just click the link in the description below. Go on out to Patreon. We ask you to pray about it. If you feel the Holy Spirit inspiring you a little bit, it is an amazing way to help us continue to get this message out to as many lives as possible. And we thank you for that. And this particular episode, we brought Jason Jones on. Jason is in the film, Doomed to Repeat It. Actually, all three of us are in the film, Doomed to Repeat It. Um, I think back, Jason, I think we interviewed you September last year. So it's been, we're going, getting close to a year of when we came down and interviewed you. You were our first major interview for this. Um, and you just hit us with, I think, two hours or so. And we got almost all of your interview in the film, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? <laughs> No, not at all. <laughs> in fact, as, as you know, uh, I've just been reading through Rotten Tomatoes, and the one thing that the world agrees on is that there was too much of other people talking and not enough of me. Exactly. Uh, that's what it was. That's what I've been reading. on. Now, I will admit, I created almost all of those accounts making those comments. Right. <laughs> Oh, that's perfect. Well, it is never enough. We know that it's never enough to have you on uh, just a few moments. We've got to have you we, on. We got a new more. name for him. Jason Cutting Room Floor Jones. Oh, ouch. Yeah. Oh, hey, Father. Yeah. Hey, Father, I didn't see a lot of you on there. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Father, you and I are on the Cutting Room Floor together. By the way, Doug, it's your exactly. movie. Exactly. <laughs> Doug, you got chopped from your own movie. I'm, I'm not in it that much. I know. I know. Yeah. My my, no. my son did most of the editing on it, and I said, son, <laughs> cut out the best scenes you have to to make this work. And well, the three of us got cut out, I think, more than anybody else. So, uh, But, you know, we had close to 20 hours of interview to boil down to about 60 minutes. And, Jason, you understand this because I know you – I mean, this is something tell, – I mean, tell the audience your background. You've been involved, I mean, movie to movement. Um, you've done a lot of this. You've done documentaries, films. Just yeah, well, I've worked on show. over probably 100 films in one capacity or another, okay. uh, half a dozen as a producer – and it, this is true. And I have to say this a lot to my friends when I make films and they're not in it. You know, if I, you know, I just did a documentary, Divided Hearts of America. We interviewed over 60 people, but half of them made the film. And again, I was the producer, not the director. And I give a long rope. You, you need a vision. You know, you don't need competing visions for a film. So as a producer, I see yourself as, I see myself as kind of the frame. And that work of art is going to come through from the director. Mm -hmm. And I'm there to give him everything he needs. And so, but I'm oftentimes having to explain to my friends who aren't in my film, who we've interviewed, some of them quite famous. And they're like, why, what happened, Jason? And I'm like, the director cut you. Yeah. <laughs> but my favorite scenes have been cut out yeah. from all of my films. For example, Eric Metaxas did not make Divided Hearts of America. Mm. As a producer, I was really tempted to say, hey, this is very important for marketing. And I felt what Eric had to say was very important. And the director was like, Jason, it was, but it did not fit 
with the story that we were telling. Right. right. And this is why I'm not an editor and why I'm not a director, although I am going to be directing my first film this year. It does take a sort of kind of vicious courage mm. to know where to cut and then cut. Yeah. And be yeah. faithful to the story. And clearly, a lot of what me, you, and Father Heilman had to say didn't wasn't faithful to the story. <laughs> well, it's funny because you know my my son is you know he's he basically took the whole project and did all the cutting and the editing on it, and you know he pretty much he he directed it. Um, I'm the executive director, so you know, but he was the one I gave all the leeway to, like you said. It's said, son, just make this thing roll, make it right, and. You know, and trying to weave in, I mean, the, the general idea of Doom to Repeat it for the audience to understand is this takes the subject of how really historically tyrannical powers, power-hungry individuals, people who just don't care about others, how they will use, in particular, fear. They'll use fear in a variety of ways, whether it's fear of arresting you and throwing you in jail or fear that you're going to succumb to some mysterious sickness that could just wipe out and ravage the entire world. And this kind of fear can be used to manipulate people, oppress people, just keep them in a state of emotional just duress. And when we're under this emotional pressure, we don't make good decisions. And this is something that we, we drew out with Dr. Joe Lepetsky, who was a great psychologist who got in on this, uh, Dr. Peter McCullough, who is very controversial for many uh, different reasons out there. And so uh, we're going to be very careful with this episode because we don't want to get taken down. But um, this is absolutely a, a key point that they both bring out regarding fear and manipulation from the medical perspective. And then John Leake is a great historian, and uh, he's actually an author as well. He writes a lot of crime stories, true crime stories, and he has seen how fear has been used in many different areas. And even historically, from the times of Rome, to Hitler, Stalin, to now, how fear has always been used. Uh, and then, of course, you two. And Father, you addressed it wonderfully. You got into how tyrants, they want to keep us afraid and how we, you know, and a really key part we, we brought you in on, you know, and we'll get some, uh, some clips here of this, is you saying what you say about how do we keep tyrants out of the picture? You know, we've got to get strong. Right. Uh, so actually, I'm going to roll that clip right now, and then we'll come back and get your, your thoughts on this. Tyrants will always exist. And what they want to do is they want to own us, okay? They, they want to control us. And a lot of the ways they do that is through their propaganda, their indoctrination. People call that their narrative, right? Um, and, and you've got a lot of people who, again, aren't connected to God, who are easily then manipulated away from God. What's the prescription, okay, to get us back to a culture that's strong, and that tyrants aren't invited into this culture. We need to get very, very connected to God again. We need a revival. We truly do. So, Father, what, what, you know what you meant there about the you know to keep tyrants out. We need a revival. Need to get back to God. Can you expound on that a little bit? Yeah, I, you know, I was reflecting on this actually. I think it was this morning's homily, but um, I, I said. You know, I went up to the to the uh, state capitol when uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned. It was actually on my birthday, June 24th, and I'm the chaplain for Pro-Life Wisconsin. So they wanted me to come up and share some words and, and pray with everybody. And there they were, thousands uh, out in the streets, and their chant was nothing other than my body, my choice. But um, I said this morning that that my heart really uh, was sick, uh, in the sense of, you know, just looking at all those souls that are lost and, and knowing that they have been manipulated the way they have. And, and of course, right away I, I went, you know, that's, that's, that's on us as, as spiritual leaders. I think we've been afraid. I think we've been silent. And, and you look at other generations I always talk about my great grandparents, great great grandparents. You know, the churches were teeming with people, and and they knew right from wrong. You know, they followed the natural law. They 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 knew. You know, you need to be honest, and and they didn't know anything about moral relativism and the end justifies the means or anything like that. If it was right, you did it. If it was wrong, you didn't. And it was just simple facts. But that was because that was a time where spiritual leaders were very loud and 
and very clear about the natural law, about divine revelation, of uh, everything. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, there just was no question. Uh, fast forward to our times, and it's it's been ambiguous as, at best. Uh, it, 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 why? And, and here's what I said, too, is that we're afraid of, of offending the wolves. Uh, the scripture passage talked about uh, how Jesus um, saw the crowd and his heart was moved with pity, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. You know, it, 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 they are. We are sheep without a shep without shepherds right now because the 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 high virtue, the highest of all virtues, among the leaders, spiritual leaders in in our church, is to not offend the wolves. Mm. And and uh, so I, I I said too the eve of uh, my birthday, but <laughs> Roe v. Wade, I was down in Beloit with the canceled priest. Uh, banquet that they had there and the room was you you could feel it the love that these people had for these priests who are being persecuted right now but they, but why did they have such great love because they felt loved okay mm. that it's true love uh, it's, it's it's and and again in scripture it talks about you know some are are not shepherds they're 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 like hired hands right and so they don't care for the sheep. Um, and I, I think we're there. I, unfortunately, mm -hmm. there's very, and it's not about love. It's about the bottom line. Uh, it's about, you know, getting along or whatever. Um, but, but, there, but there is a fear too of offending the wolves or, and especially offending the tyrants. Because why? Because again, the bottom line, the tyrants will do damage. Yeah, the tyrants will attack. Okay, and and along with their useful idiots, but but they they will attack, and so we can't provoke them. Mm. Is 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 where we are right now, and that's why evil's having such an easy time of it. So yeah, I I honestly I looked out at those thousands that were marching, and uh, my heart moved for them because I knew they were disconnected from God, mm. and and then right away I went. It's it's our fault. It's the shepherd's fault. Yeah. You know, and, we, and and you you a lot of that just out of the fear. The shepherds have been afraid to speak out. You think a lot of them have just yeah, been afraid. To, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and and of course, when I say shepherds, I'm mostly referring to bishops. But sure. But now the priests uh, mm -hmm. are are fearful. I mean, you look at the canceled priests. That that's uh, the chilling effect. Mm -hmm. That that uh, we see what we did to these priests. So you don't dare say anything because it's going to happen to you too. Right. Right. And, uh, I, I might get canceled. Yeah. Uh, but I'll lay down my life for my sheep. I'll, I'll risk my priesthood, but I will not let the wolves devour them. Yeah. And, you know, and Jason, I mean, you know, one of the parts we, I mean, we interviewed you for, we had a couple hours worth of interview and, you know, had to pick some of the best parts. You know, and there was so much to pick from. We're thinking of doing just a director's cut that is just all you. You know, we're thinking about doing something like that. If you think that'd be that'd all be right. Cool. Oh, I would buy it in a minute. That would <laughs> I <be>. would. <laughs> <laughs> Director cut, Jason Jones. I hope people get my sense of humor. You know, on my podcast, I'm very campy. And the whole joke is how much I like the sound of my own voice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whenever I'm on Beer Wozniak's podcast, I, I, you know, or his TV show, I call it. Deep Adventure starring Jason Jones uh, <laughs> with Bear Wozniak. <laughs> yeah, Bear just contacted me about getting on his show about this. So it's it's uh, it, it it's nice that he hasn't forgotten about me. So you get to no, hang out with all. him. I was just there. with him in Hawaii and we were yeah. talking about both of you. You know, and that's <clears throat> the beautiful thing about being thrust by the Holy Spirit in between the vulnerable, in between the wolves and the sheep, mm. is you get to look around you and you see a lot of great people. Like even for me, it's been a long kind of hard day today with my work. And so here I am just getting to be with you two. And uh, it's, it's very good for my morale. And I think for all of those of us who watch Grace Force, watching you two is very good for our morale and to know that we're not alone. And really, um, the pro-life movement, you know who I felt sorry for? I hope I don't get in trouble, Father. We, you here, I, I feel like I have to watch my mouth a little bit. But <laughs> and I think Neither of you have learned your lesson. If this is how you're behaving when YouTube lets you back on, I think I can <laughs> on behalf of YouTube and your listeners that having me on as a guest shows you're, you're, you're not learning. Your yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a dangerous move. There's no question. <laughs> no. 
But yeah. with you and your father, it's, it's I would have to say. blonde hair. That's a, uh, but go yeah. ahead. <laughs> I still say I it's blonde. I think that, um, you know what? You feel sorry for those anti -abor those pro-abortion marchers, those abortion right. industry protesters. I look at my in past 30, some 33, so, some years in the pro-life movement. And I entered the pro-life movement as a very lonely, alienated 17-year-old with no mentors, not knowing up from down, north from south. Uh, all I knew is that destroying a child in the womb is insane. And that I wanted to stop that. But what I didn't know is that I would be entering a movement filled with such beautiful, kind, decent people. Mm -hmm. And so for me to be a part of the pro-life movement and to know folks like you, um, and what made me think of this is, you know, our mutual friend and Bear Wozniak, um, Doug, I just, I've been getting a lot of messages lately from people mm -hmm. who have been following some of my more recent videos, but then our, your interview with me over a decade ago with Vicki hmm. Thorne on EWTN. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. We'll still comment on that. And that Vicki Thorne was my friend huh. that I knew father Paul Marx, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, I met ambassador Alan Keyes as a college student. Just all of the privileges and opportunities that standing with the child in the womb has given me. But the greatest has been just being surrounded by beautiful men like you two and Bear and all the wonderful women too that have been in my life as examples. Um, that's the great gift of the pro-life movement. Yeah. So those anti, those, those pro-abortion marchers, I feel sorry for them because I know that they have not experienced genuine love. Right. Um, not even romantic love. Yeah. Uh, not even friendship, love, uh, yeah. and definitely not love of God. And it's very sad. And then I looked at people, leaders in the church, that they have separated themselves from such a beautiful community. And what I say is when you stand with someone nailed to a cross uh, as their friend, all the jerks have left the room. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> You know, it's just yeah. by God's grace that people that are standing at the foot of the cross with the vulnerable, which is what this movie Doomed to Repeat It is about, it's the best way to run to suffering community, um, go to prison ministry, volunteer at a pregnancy center, pray in front of an abortion clinic. This is the surest way to meet the most wonderful people in the world. Amen, brother. Well, and, yeah, I appreciate all that. That's, and I think you're you're right on with that. This is, and what we've tried to do with the film and you know feedback we've gotten so far from people has been has been very good. And I'm just going to tell people right now: you click the link in the description below, you can go out and watch this right now for free. It's just out there. We want people to see it. We had some great contributors to get the project covered financially, which is enormous help. And I know, Jason, you're you're helping us get it promoted and, and marketed out there to more people. Father's been a tremendous help getting the word out and getting it promoted as well. And this is what we're looking for. John Henry Weston, uh, he watched, uh, he contacted me just today and said he he loves it, thought it was awesome. And he's ready to, to work with us to get the word out through LifeSite News. He says they definitely will cover it. And this is what we're looking for, any and all avenue to get the word out, because we want people to be inspired to exactly what you just said, Jason, about the idea of going to, to different places, locations that you feel God has called you to do in some way, shape, or form, to be part of that beautiful godly resistance to the tyrants that are trying to oppress. This is an age-old thing. This goes back to you know, the fall of man, where we've always had that spirit of evil that wants to get into someone's heart and let that become a manipulation so that the spirit of evil can work through people to oppress and destroy people on so many levels. And Jason, I'm going to play a clip here uh, for the, of, the, of the film where, uh, again, you're talking about just, just such an amazing key point that a lot of people take for granted. And then we'll come back. We can, we can get your comment on it. It's nobody's small bureaucrats that do the greatest evil, not driven by ideology, just wanting to impress their boss or thoughtlessness. Thousands of little people making little decisions that send millions of people to gas chambers. So Jason, what break that down a bit more in detail, if you don't mind, about just all those people that are making decisions. I thought it was an amazing point that has to be considered is that this is not just the, the top tier individuals. The, you know, as we talk about in the military, the top tier operators, you know, who are the real special ops guys, but it's the guys running the supply line that allow the top tier operators to operate. It's the guys that are bringing ammunition to the front lines so the soldiers in the foxhole can keep the fight going. But in the negative sense and on the side of of cooperating with evil there are a lot of people out there we're we don't know who they are but they're making decisions that are really crushing people in in many different ways talk more about that if you could yeah. well i'm grateful for your analogy because 
this idea of the banality of evil, this idea that nobodies, and we, as, of course, as Christians, as Catholics, as personalists, we wouldn't want to call anyone nobody, but this idea that nobodies make the decisions that lead to these great atrocities or carry out these orders was, was, was from the, the Jewish-German philosopher Hannah Arendt, who was covering, I believe for Vanity Fair, the Eichmann trials. And she caused quite the stir when she said that Eichmann was not a monster. Uh, it was something worse. He was just a nobody. And that he wasn't a virulent anti-Semite. In fact, he had been a Zionist as a young man. But that he had just wanted to impress his bosses. Mm. And that it was these small little decisions of being liked at work, impressing his employer, um, going along to get along that it was the banality of evil that leads to monstrous catastrophes. If you think of just this, this week, um, hundreds of Green Berets and Navy SEALs and fighter pilots and, and just regular old grunts, line infantrymen like me, are being, um, uh, they're being kicked out of the military because they have refused to take this vaccine, which they think is unethical. And well, for that to happen, that means someone at every level of the chain of command has failed them. It's the banality of evil. We can't just blame Joe Biden or the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of the Army. It means that at every level of the chain of command, there's nobody kicking back. And so if there's the banality of evil, it's small things that lead to great evil. Well, then something we as Catholics know very well, it's the little things, it's the little choices that we make that have an incredible uh, effect. If we look at the overturning of Roe versus Wade, who do we give credit to? Well, the millions of men and women that volunteered at pregnancy centers over the past 50 years, that prayed in front of abortion clinics, that have volunteered at their local or state political party meeting to fight for the platform committee of their political party, that have volunteered on campaigns from the state house to the White House, um, that have had the courage to speak up at a faculty meeting or at a dinner party, and it's these millions of people making little decisions where they were afraid to stand up for the child in the womb, but they stood up anyways. It was those little decisions that led to this great victory. And I would say there are other roads that need to be overturned that we as Catholics especially have to have courage speaking out on. You know, in the 70s, they sold abortion as a bat mitzvah, as a great rite of passage for women, something to be celebrated. Of course, that lie quickly faded away. Um, but they continued to try to sell abortion in the interest of women. And if you opposed abortion, you were anti-women. Well, in the same way, they sell our broken immigration system, which is the whole country recently discovered with almost 60 uh, migrants dying in a hot van, mm -hmm. probably begging Our Lady for intercession. They died. You know, our open borders is leading to children dying in our neighborhoods of fentanyl, from fentanyl coming across the southern border of migrants suffocating and dying of heat exhaustion in the backs of trucks. Do you think we find out about all the immigrants that die coming across? No, they, they try to hide that, right? Immigrants are dying every day being brought into this country and then to be exploited in a dangerous underground economy. Those of us who are pro-life need to speak up and we need to break, we need to fix mm -hmm. our broken immigration system. We need to secure our Southern border to protect our children from fentanyl to protect migrants from economic exploitation, to protect low uh, income earning Americans, to protect their wages and their jobs, something we need to do. We also need to decouple our economy from the CCP. Do you know how many people listening to this, uh, standing up against the CCP would put their job in jeopardy, right? So uh, the CCP is, is, um, is intermingled with our economy at every level. So this is something that all of us need to do. We need to decouple our economy from the CCP. We need to decouple our economy from this system of exploitation of migrants that leaves all of us vulnerable to terrorism and to drugs and to guns, illegal guns uh, and the underground economy. So these are places where we, all of us have to have courage and speak out knowing that we'll be called all sorts of names. Um, while in fact, what's ordering our activism and our action as Catholics is a commitment to the vulnerable. Mm. And no one is more vulnerable now than our posterity, our yet to be born posterity, that have a tyranny, a tyrannical, out of control, abusive government uh, working its way through his history and headed right for them. It's up to us to work to leave a political community that respects human dignity, 
that strives to correspond its positive laws uh, to the transcendent moral order, to the natural law, to the divine will. And this is something that each and every one of us can do. So there's the banality of evil, um, but also there's those little acts of good that, that, can, yeah. that, that we can celebrate that just each and every time we say, no, I'm, I'm not going to comply to this abusive rule. Um, each time we speak up for the child in the womb or we stand up for the Uyghur and Chinese occupied East Turkestan, each time we do that, we're planting a little olive tree that can shelter our grandchildren. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I look at um, where we're at, and, and we, we've been talking about fear, and it is. It's fear. Uh, fear of retribution, if you go against the ideology, uh, the narrative, whatever, of our time. But who's, who's uh, steering the ship? You know, who, who's out in front? Of I, do, I do believe there's a small elite class, an oligarchy, that has control of this right now. And it, it trinkles down in a sense where, where you're afraid of being punished, okay, some kind of retribution if you get out of line. But here's the other thing I think that people are afraid of. That, and I think this is the bigger reason. I think they're afraid of not fitting in, okay, <clears throat> of not being a part of the popular class, the elites, those who have a sense of superiority, right? And I, they don't want to be seen as with the peasants, you know, that's us. We're the flyover states. We're the deplorables. Mm -hmm. We don't know any better. We actually follow the natural law. We actually follow divine revelation. I mean, that's so outdated, right? I mean, who does that anymore? Uh, we don't know any better. So the sense of superiority, and that's intoxicating, I think, and especially for college kids, you know, well, I'm in a university now. And, and so look at the knowledge, the superior knowledge that I have, and I want to be accounted among those who have the superior knowledge. I, my pet peeve of growing up, and especially it was in high school, but it was in grade school too, was cliques, right? Uh, the, these, these groups that counted themselves as superior to others. And every once in a while, they'd poke fun at some awkward person or whatever. And that was kind of a chilling effect, you know? Don't come against us. or Look what you're going to get. But, but, but kids longed to want to be counted among that superior group, that superior clique. I hated it with a passion. Uh, I happened to be a person who, who would go and find the, the person that was standing off to the side that felt like they didn't fit in. Um, and I think that's what we're called to do as Christians. You know, the last shall be first, the first shall be last, take the last seat, all this stuff. But, um, but to me, I think that's driving, uh, the driving force more. Yes, it's fear, but it's fear of, of not fitting in or not being a part of the high click of our culture, mm. the, the elites of our culture. And, and that is so strong, so strong that people will uh, sacrifice, make huge sacrifices uh, to, to fit in. And I believe some are even making the sacrifice of choosing a different gender, mm. you know, or, or whatever, because that will help their brand, that will help them to fit in more. So it's really sad what's going on. But I mean, Jason, can you comment on that? I, I think it comes out too in, in, the, in the film, but, but this idea of, of wanting to be counted among the elites, do you see it that way? Yeah, I mean, I most definitely see that in Washington, D.C. Part of the nature right. of my job at the Vulnerable People Project to give away our secret sauce is to develop authentic friendships with people in positions of influence. I always teach my team, we don't pretend to like people we don't like. We find the people in those positions that we like and really develop our friendships. Mm -hmm. And so I've developed friendships with people that, that work in that space. And you can see there's one young woman in particular that I'm thinking of that works for a government agency that I've just seen her get swept away during her time there during the Biden administration because she was kind of an awkward, lonely girl from a broken family who was a great student. And I always say she's very pious to the gods of the city. And I think that's something that we see. There's, and and that, that piety to the gods of the city is really kind of a conservatism. It's don't disrupt the order. Whatever that order is, they're going to guard that order. Mm -hmm. And it's a public piety. They wore their masks the way I wear my scapular. 
Yep. It was a sign of yeah. solidarity and commitment to the community. So it doesn't hat. matter if it works or if it doesn't work. It doesn't matter yeah. if it's dehumanizing or not. It's something that shows that you are committed to your community. It is an outward sign, right? It's a sacrament right. to them. It's a sacramental. But, mm -hmm. but I think it goes to, too, that <clears throat> a sense of superiority or we know better than the deplorables, you know? So this is a sign that we... We, we're scientific and we... They're we, Gnostics, right? It's yeah, yeah, they're Gnostics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's sad, right? Because um, they don't know better and they know they don't know better as individuals, but they're leaning on the, the, the gods of the cities, what they've promulgated, what their catechism is. Right. And they just have faith. Whatever it says, they believe. And it is because I, I think what you've said, Father is they don't want to be ostracized. They're right. lonely. They're alienated. They want to impress their family. I joke, I'm lucky. Um, my parents had no hope for me. I was last in my class. They had no expectations of me. Um, my dad used to tell me when I was a kid, if you grow up and you're a ditch digger and all you do is get dig, uh, dig ditches, um, if that makes you happy, we're happy. That was my dad's way of saying, son, you're going to grow up to be a ditch digger. <laughs> and... Um, by the way, I did that for a while as an infantryman. I dug a lot of holes. Yeah, nice. Was not very good at it. it. Was no fun at all. I can tell you, especially in monsoon season in Southeast Asia, digging holes is horrible. But, <laughs> um, but I and I was a father at seventeen or eighteen. So, I, as even as a young boy, when I was in college after the military, and I saw how other people were afraid to express their opinions on these controversial issues because they didn't want to be socially ostracized. Right. I kind of like, I have a family. I don't care what you people think of me, you know? So it is, it is, it is, um, uh, they're enslaved by this very natural human desire to belong to a community. Right. Yeah. So that fear of, of not being in that circle, in that group is, is another part of the fear. And, and I think, you know, tyrants, people who are power hungry, people who know how to use these things to manipulate, use that to play it up. And there's something, another part of the film I want to show here, Jason, where you talk about the cancel culture and how that whole spirit of cancel culture can really devolve into something much more violent. So let's, let's play this and get back to your, your thoughts on it. Antifa would bring guillotines and put them in front of people's houses, elected officials and others. You look at cancel culture. The cancel culture is the culture of that. And the cancel culture will, can quickly descend into the types of horrible violence we saw in the French Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, that we saw in Cambodia with the Khmer Rouge. And, and they're influenced by the very same ideologies. They take as a symbol the guillotine. And I think that's very important because the guillotine is, you take this bad person, this person that's disrupting the good of the community, and you lop off their head and then we'll have order. Oh, you lop off his head, and is there order? Is there peace? Is there justice? Is there prosperity? No. Okay, well, we found these guys. Now lop off these guys' heads, and they're the bad guys. We'll take all of these people, this ethnic community. Okay, then this is gonna be it, and it never ends. In the French Revolution, they would call the guillotine holy, the holy guillotine. So Jason, I mean, pretty bold statement, but I agree with it 100%, which is one of the reasons it's in the film is we all agreed with it on the team over here that this cancel culture mindset can actually devolve very quickly into violence. Um, your thoughts on that more in detail? Yeah, well, I would defer to our confessor here. Um, calumny, Father, falls under what sin? Um, lying? I thought it was murder. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yep, yep. And when you destroy someone's reputation... Right. You destroy their ability to make a living. You destroy their ability to belong and fit sure. into the community. Mm -hmm. They're being exiled. A white martyrdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're being socially yeah. ostracized. Right. And then those of us who are not impacted by cancel culture, I think so many of us, because we have our intact communities, we're ordered to the transcendent, to God. We're really not bothered by what the mob on Twitter has to say. That enrages them. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so if, if destroying your reputation or suspending you from YouTube for four months doesn't do the job or four weeks doesn't do the job, violence always follows. We see this in the history with iconoclasts. 
Iconoclasts are never happy. They're never, they never end with just destroying uh, icons, right? So what we see is they destroy the, they burn down the churches and they always end up killing people. Mm. And sadly, in the wake of Roe v. Wade, with all of this violence to churches and to pro-life medical centers, which in the first 48 hours of the ruling, I think um, more pregnancy centers and multitude were burned to the ground or vandalized than had been done by quote unquote advocates of the uh, anti-abortion advocates since the founding of Roe. Can you imagine that? Yeah. Um, and and you know, and the funny thing, Jason, is that that didn't make the news. The average news doesn't cover that thing. No, the New York Times actually had a big horrifying story that that pro-lifers have said they're willing to use violence to defend themselves from acts of violence. Oh wow, really? And that just really shocked the New York Times that <laughs> I guess we're just supposed to allow them to burn our houses to the ground and yeah. and brutalize our families. But they found it horrifying that pro-lifers had claimed that they are willing to defend themselves from violence. Which is incredible when you think about it. I mean, and this fits very much in with the idea of the film Doomed to Repeat It, the manipulation, because we do a whole piece in there on propaganda and how things being, you know, prop propagandized. And, you know, Father Heilman, you got, you got, you know, put in timeout on Facebook when you put out the, the, the Goebbels quote. Right. That which is in the time. film. We put was... that in the film, that quote. About just tell that lie over and over and over, and eventually but people you are got, buy into it. You quoted Goebbels, and you were suspended. Yeah, that that uh, uh, yeah. you tell people a square as a circle long enough, they'll believe it. I mean, I'm I'm paraphrasing, but what was, that was the, the first time I was ever put in Facebook for just putting up that quote? Yeah, put in Facebook jail for putting up that quote. It's it's really unbelievable. That's very strange. Well, yeah. it's strange that Massive Ages has been banned from YouTube. Just right. To Right. Pro life. I mean, uh, CatholicMiracles.com yeah. has been banned yeah. from um, social media. You can't put a website up yeah. showing miracles like Our Lady appearing in Zaytun on video. Uh, yeah. Very strange. Which, which I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, con I'm concerned and curious to see what happens here now. This is our first episode back on YouTube since the four month timeout, and my understanding is we have one more strike and we're gone for good. And why we have you on, Jason, as a guest <laughs> to run that risk, I just don't know. But we thought you'd be perfect because of the film. So, <laughs> well, you know, it's, 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 we live in strange times. I don't think either mm. of us have ever imagined it would, the ball would bounce in the strange way that it has bounced. Yeah. And, but it's not anything new. There's this powerful film by Terrence Malick. I hope you've seen it. If not, I hope you see it. It's a, called A Hidden Life. And it's on the yeah. Austrian uh, farmer martyr, um, Jägerstadter. And he, um, he was martyred for refusing to say the Hitler loyalty oath. But even his Catholic community and even his priest recommend that he just say the oath. He had a wife and kids and he should just say the oath. And he said, I didn't know being a father and a husband gave me permission to offend God. Wow. And he gave his life. And because he was Austrian, um, the Nazis didn't, the SS that were in charge of sort of handling him really did not want to kill him. And they gave him every chance and every chance to just say the, the loyalty oath. They said, you didn't even have to go in the military. You don't have to do anything. Just in private, say the oath. And in the film, it's represented as the SS officer's Catholic. And he says to him, do you think you have the right not to say this oath? And he looks at the SS officer and says, do you think I have the right to say it? Hmm. That's yeah. good. That's a really good question. Because I think a lot of people are, they're just caught up in the fear of it, that the idea of saying an oath, the idea of giving in, the idea of just following the, the trends and, and, you know, the whole mindset. So the New York times does an article saying how shocking it would be that people would actually stand up and protect and defend themselves against violence that is being threatened against them or actually happening. Yeah. Um, it, it, how, how Jason, do you think it's possible that people would accept because they will, they'll buy into that idea and the premise of that article thinking, yeah, that makes sense. How dare those pro those pro-lifers feel that way and, and would actually stand up and defend themselves. How dare churches would start to create even security teams to protect their parishioners. We had an incident here in Tyler just uh, a couple weeks ago where um, it was actually the weekend of the premiere. We had the premiere out in Dallas and I got a text from a friend 
who said that he had heard he was out of town and he said, Doug, I've heard that there are about 100 pro pro abortionists walking toward the cathedral right now, marching down there, and that there were bricks that were just randomly a handful of bricks laying around the cathedral. Imagine how those just maybe showed up somehow. Um, and I said, well, I'm out of town too. I'm, let me make a couple calls. And these are guys that I've worked with in some security training we've done and some self-defense stuff we've done. And I called a couple of guys. Long story short, yeah, they did come down there. And one of the guys that I work with, Steve, he rallied a bunch of guys and they went out and there were some women too. And they formed up a line around the cathedral. Some, one of the women actually went around and collected all the bricks and put them away from the right protesters who would have gotten near them. You know, how dare pro, pro-lifers or, or faithful, you know, Christians would stand up and actually stand their ground. They weren't violent, but they basically formed up a line to say, we're not just going to let you walk right in and create some kind of chaos and havoc here. But Jason, I mean, you talk about this when you get to the part about the guillotine in the film. And I, I can't encourage people enough. Click the link in the description. The film is on YouTube. It's on many other platforms. We're, pr- we're promoting it as far and wide as we can. Watch it. It's an inspirational film to help people realize that we have a responsibility here because we've seen, and we are doomed to repeat it again, if we don't learn from this, we have seen violence and destruction and chaos consume many different societies over the years. But Jason, this is something, and Dr. Peter McCullough, who's you know, so- somewhat controversial regarding medical situations and viruses in the world going on, he makes clear that this whole virus situation, to try to not be banned, uh, is not over with, that they're going to continue to force this upon us. And at the question answer period at the premiere, he was very open to say, look, this is not what people think. This is not over yet. And John Leake, the historian, brought this point up. And Jason, I want to get your comment on this. He said, what you saw in the Cuban uh, fiasco, and that's a key part of the film, is we have a couple of individuals who are Cuban refugees who go into great detail of the trauma on families and the death and execution and, and chaos that went on in Cuba in 59 when Batista was forced out by Castro and then Che Guevara, who was just, a, you know, the guy was a beast. You know, you know, he actually, we have a quote in the film where he talks about loving the smell of blood and gunpowder. He wrote this to his father. The man was just twisted. Shot, off. shot one of my good friend's uncles in the face, killed one of my good friend's uncles. Oh, he yeah. did, really? Yeah. Wow. I mean, incredible stuff, though. But, you know, this is something that our historian friend, John Leake, who's in the film, says. He said that it's impractical and inefficient. And this is in the question and answer period after the premiere that night. We did the premiere in Dallas, which you were invited to, Jason. And I know you complain a little bit about not being in the film. But then again, you did skip the premiere. Something about, I don't know, you had another family event. I don't know. I had to walk my daughter down the aisle. Yeah, okay. All right. So it was a wedding of your daughter in Hawaii. I understand. I still don't know that you should have skipped the premiere. Okay, maybe, maybe. Okay. (laughs) Your daughter would have understood. Yeah, well, yeah. Your daughter would understand. This is a big movie. I don't think she would have understood. (laughs) (laughs) But in the question and answer period afterwards, John Leake points out that you know, moving soldiers all over a country the size of the U.S. or Europe or wherever is really not an, as efficient as it would have been, say, in a place like Cuba, which is a much smaller area to work with. But there are other ways that tyrannical governments or manipulative power-hungry people can effectively imprison, air quotes, people by creating a sense of fear, a sense of, I don't know, mandate, lockdown sort of idea, separating, dividing, and threatening. As you mentioned, Jason, earlier, that there are a lot of our military that are being kicked out right about right. now yeah, because they won't go along with the mandates, air quotes again, to receive a Because needle. our bishops aren't standing for them. If the bishops would have stood up, these men would have their, and women would have their jobs, their pensions, their retirement. Yeah. yeah. The analogy key- of evil. It's yeah, not it, it just Joe Biden. It's yes. all those bishops, yes. all those yeah. yep. priests that refuse to write medical exemptions, yep. uh, refuse to speak up. And yeah, Doug, you mentioned earlier about like the violence to the churches and why do they get off thinking they can do this? I'm going to, I always, you know, Rene Girard, I appeal to Rene Girard a lot. He says, when you yeah. stand with the vulnerable to the mob, and this is a direct quote from Girard, when you stand with the scapegoat, the vulnerable that the mob is targeting, you become indistinguishable to the mob from the scapegoat. Mm -hmm. So if the child in the womb has no rights, 
if you can kill the child in the womb at any time in its development, and you're standing for the child in the womb, like Nick Sandman was, mm -hmm. well, then um, you have no rights. Anyone can be violent to you, hit you in the head with a brick, punch you, kick you. We've seen this at the Supreme Court over the past couple of weeks where pro-lifers are being attacked. Mm -hmm. It's not being mentioned. The media is not covering the violence to the pro-life pregnancy centers. Why? Because those centers stand with the child in the womb and the status quo, the establishment has said, the child in the womb is outside of protection. Yeah. So you stand with that child, you're outside of protection. Yeah. Guilty by association. You associate with them, you're guilty just as much as them. You know, they're calling for the abolishing of the Supreme Court. They're calling to defy the third, I mean, it's one of the three branches of the government and they're calling to just do away with it in the face of all of this. You I know, say we do away with Congress. How about that, the House? <laughs> <laughs> well, it says we just get to just wipe whole bodies off the map. Well, why is it the Supreme Court all of a sudden? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. I keep thinking uh, with a few minutes left to go. Um, I I'd like to talk a little bit about. So where do we go from here? You know what what do we do about this uh, situation that we're in, in here? And if we don't do it, we're doomed to repeat it. But uh, again, I keep going to that strong faith of the great grandparents, the great, great grandparents. I, I talked about how they wouldn't drive by a church without stopping in for a chapel visit. But, but it was again, a time where they felt real love from the spiritual leaders the, the, that they loved the, the, the shepherd loved the sheep enough to put their whole life on the line, to put their priesthood on the line. But, but, but to stand up, and say, you know, here's what the wolves are doing, and you can't go along with that. And I'm telling you this because I want you to get to heaven, because I love you, you're part of my family. So we've been talking in our diocese about, and it's happening in, in every diocese, but, you know, how few are going to church anymore. Well, here's what I think is going on. They don't feel loved. You know, it's just, you're, you're just there. We, 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 uh, we fulfill an obligation. The, the the priest, you know, does what he has to do, and you know, we sing the you know the songs. And but where's the love? And and, and I know, and I've always said the hope of the future is these young priests that have come in. Yet I think a lot of them have felt the chilling effect, and have slowed way down. Especially, um, you can connect the dots if you want. What I mean by that. But they've slowed way down. Why? Because they're afraid. And they're afraid they're not going to be supported if they speak up or if they offer the most sacred and reverent mass they can possibly offer. Because you know what? People are going to get angry if we do that. Because you know why? You're taking this too seriously. I want to wear my cutoff shorts and my T-shirt and, and, and grab the host like a potato chip so that it doesn't demand too much of me. You dare offer this mass in a serious way. And there's a, there's a parish in town that's going, going through this. They will write the bishop. They will divide the parish. They will destroy your reputation. And the bishop um, in other dioceses, I think our bishop's doing pretty well, <clears throat> will, 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 will let you, let you, uh, will, let you be devoured by the wolves. And so there needs to be a revival, but it's not going to come by another program that we punch a clock with. It's going to come with love. I mean, real love. I mean, and how do we get there? I, 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 I believe with all my heart, and I think we were shown something with the sacred heart of Jesus, you know, June 24th, Roe v. Wade. And I think we've been shown that a lot, but, but we've got to, uh, we've got to, have a revival, but it, it, it can't, it's not real. It's not authentic. It's not genuine. If it's not about a deepening of our love. Does that make sense? No, it does. And love is what gives us courage. Right. And young people today are being robbed of love. They're being, they're their family, their parents are divorced and they're stuck in a gig economy, working this job and that job relentlessly. Um, the children are trapped and they didn't even get to go to school and meet friends. They're, um, you know, looking at a computer, isolated, alone all day. Uh, they don't have the chance to experience eros or romantic love. 
yeah. because they're bombarded with pornography before puberty and yeah. and Tinder after puberty. And mm-hmm. it's just really devastating. And I think, Father, you hit the nail on the head. I don't see a genuine passionate love for God and for our neighbor. And I mean, passionate love where you're willing to immolate yourself, where you're willing to die. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, if 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 people can't see on the news, 58 migrants die in the bed of a truck and then watching politicians spin that no where is the genuine love for those people because we know they're probably by the way our co-religionists where was our love as a catholic community in the united states when iraqi catholics and christians from that first century church were being wiped off the face of the earth by isis and i couldn't hear a single homily about it as i traveled the country Uh, we abandoned afghanistan and um, the state department has said that that 70,000 plus SIV uh, qualified um, Afghans are stuck in safe houses still and won't be processed, will probably be found and killed. You know, where is love? You know, I I don't see that. Where's the love for our posterity? Most people probably, you know, uh, on the radical left don't even have posterity. But for those of us with children and grandchildren, we need to order our life to serve our yet unborn children, grandchildren and great grandchildren. We are going to die in Mordor. Yeah. Uh, to quote Frodo, we will save the Shire, but not for us. We are not going to the Shire. We will be in Mordor. Even the overturning of Roe v. Wade is just the Supreme Court opening the door for us to walk through to create a culture of life. Even a human life amendment to the constitution protecting the child in the womb from biological beginning uh, uh, is still really just the first steps towards a culture of life. Mm-hmm. Our economy is mingled with the CCP, which rests on forced abortions and slavery. We have bishops and priests who have been disappeared. We have Cardinal Zen, one of the most prominent Catholic figures in the world in the past 100 years, being persecuted. We have a pro tennis player in China just disappeared. The world isn't asking questions. ESPN is, is covering Wimbledon and not asking questions. We need to ask questions. Right. We need to speak up for the vulnerable. And, and that to me is, is what this age is about. Running to those who are, don't worry about being ostracized. You will be, we got that. We will be banned from YouTube. Yep. Um, but so what? What bothers me more is the thought of people out there not knowing God loves them. Violence is the greatest scandal. Uh, not knowing God loves them. Can you imagine being a Christian and hiding in Afghanistan today? Yeah. How, mm. how scared and confused and alone you must be. Yeah. Where did your American friends go? The American yeah. church groups sustaining you, where did they go? Leaving you to be cold and hungry and martyred alone. Um, well, when they know we love them, we order our life to serve them, that gives them hope. And mm. that's what the pro-life movement has taught me. Serve the vulnerable with no thought of, obviously we, we want political success and cultural success, but that will come. But all that I can guarantee is that, that my life is directed at serving those people who feel abandoned and alone. Yes. I yes. want to be like St. Damien. Give me leprosy. I'm fine with that. Yes. Give me social leprosy. Cancel me. Whatever. Right. That doesn't bother me. What bothers me is someone feeling canceled who doesn't yep. know God loves them. And is abandoned and alone, suicidal ideation, all of this. And so this is the this is why I love your film because it gives us really we are doomed. Uh, well, you know it's it appears that we're doomed to repeat it, but God does a, a miracles. Overturning mm-hmm. of Roe v. Wade to me on the date that it happened is just a beautiful miracle that came about through a lot yeah. of people corresponding their life to God's grace to yeah. serve the child in the womb. But that it happened when it happened and that we could pray at football games and that you can even protect yourself in Chicago from from violent criminals by concealing carry. All of these things are unbelievable. The next Supreme Court next year is going to even be more radical from what we're hearing. Um, And that's giving us an opportunity to serve and create a culture of life where we are. Yep. Yeah. Well, I I just got to say, you know, I know we're we're running out of time here, but I just want to say that this film is intended to help inspire and motivate people to realize if we don't respond again we're doomed to repeat it as the saying goes if we don't learn the mistakes of history we're doomed to repeat them 
And we are seeing so many signs right now worldwide, you know, in the US here, but all over the place that are showing that we're not on a great trajectory. However, we do address at the end of the film, all of you, you, you two, um, myself, uh, and the other guests that we have in the film all give some positive, very strong messages about what can be done right. in order for us not to be so doomed or to, in other words, let's lessen, mitigate, let's, let's reduce the damage. Let's, let's mitigate the chaos. Let's, let's do this, but we've got to be on board. And I know there are people out there that are looking for a silver bullet, one thing that can be done. And that's not how we, we answer it in the film. We give a, a different approach to what can be done. I really want people to watch this. I beg people, please go watch this film. It's an hour long. It's free. Uh, share it with others. It's a great, it's a great conversation piece. It doesn't get political in the sense of focusing on one party or another. We don't do that in this. That's not the point of it. The point of it is to realize that this is just about when the spirit of man cooperates with the spirit mm -hmm. of evil, that we're, we can find ourselves in a real, real bad situation. Yeah. But as you've both mentioned, and Jason, you've very, very clearly stated when we cooperate with God, with the Holy spirit and stand with the vulnerable, do the right thing, be that little that little voice that's saying I'm standing up for truth rather than the little voice that says I'm going to go along and impress my boss even if it means the destruction of this person that person and many other. I'm going to do the right thing in my circle my corner my home my family my parish the pulpit that I'm in as a priest for you Father that's going to help turn the tide and yep. everybody has to get on board with this. So, I just want to thank both of you for being part of this project. This was, you know, 13 months in the, in the making and we're thrilled that it's where it is now. And Jason, everything you're going to do to help us, you know, get it out to a wider audience and father, what you're doing right now to help us get it out to a wider audience. But please, everybody watch this film, share it with others and uh, let's, let's spread it uh, wide and far. Um, any last comment from either of you two about the film uh, that you'd like to share with people? Well, I'll, I'll go first. I, I just think it's timely. I mean, we, we, it's another way of us to speak up and speak out and and to take a stand. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, like you said, Doug, it really helps us to clarify. You know, we want truth. We we want we want to see clearly uh, what the devil's up to, and also we want to understand, you know, what we're capable of doing. And I think this this uh, this this film goes a long way with that. So I really encourage people to to watch this. Good. Thank you, Father. And Jason, I know you're still kind of sore about how, how much of you were, was cut out of it. I, I apologize for that. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm you know, it's, obviously I don't mind at all. It's, uh, I'm kidding. Yeah. I make a lot of films and we cut a lot of people. I was cut mostly out of my movie, Divided Hearts of America, on Fox Nation <laughs> Now. I mean, it's just, it, and I, I do say of, of all my films that I've produced, my favorite scenes, my favorite scene from Crescendo was cut out. My favorite scene from Bella was, cut out my two of my favorite scenes from divided hearts of america were cut out and but that it's not about the scenes um that's why i joked with you off air that i was trying to have this second best scene in your film so you wouldn't cut me out but that's still <laughs> but but what i will say this that um i of course was moved by it i wrote a book with john zmirak the race to save our century that was sort of addressing the same thing that our book came out almost a decade ago saying we are careening towards a century of genocide democide and total war and now with what happened in Iraq and Syria, um, uh, Yemen, Libya, and, and, and Chinese-occupied East Turkestan, uh, with the rise of transhumanism, a new, mm -hmm. um, uh, really startlingly evil uh, brand of subhumanism, uh, there are, there, were, there were constantly being inundated with threats to human dignity. It is the role of the Christian. I think it is Catholics, and through our formation, we especially understand this, of all Christians. It is our role to stand with those who have been abandoned outcast. Yep. And, and no one is more vulnerable than the yet to be born, our posterity. It, it, we just celebrated the fourth. Our founding fathers wrote in every document, they, they said, to ourselves and to our posterity. Hmm. And I think many generations now have forgotten about the posterity. But what your film does is it orders our thoughtfulness to our posterity because, um, what we are really doomed, we've lived most of our life in the cream of other lives' sacrifices, of generations yeah. of sacrifice. We have lived, and most of this audience has lived in that cream. 
And uh, I think, you know, if you've ever gotten that really great organic yogurt, we're coming to the end of the cream, it looks like. It's <laughs> our responsibility to plant olive trees. Mm -hmm. um, it's our responsibility to serve the vulnerable. And by God's grace, through our Catholic formation, we understand that. And I really pity folks who are lost and don't really understand the surest way to, to live out our life mission as a human being, to love God and to love our neighbor is to serve those that other people can't see or are afraid to serve because of the social cost. Yeah. Um, yeah. And when we order our life to those who've been outcast and abandoned, like the child in the womb, um, in a way, I think that is the silver bullet. If all of us are ordering our lives to the most vulnerable people in our community, in our families, in our neighborhood, um, well, that then will be a culture of life. Yeah. yeah. Good. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jason. Yeah, thanks, this has Jason. been wonderful. And uh, thanks, Doug, for uh, we're really working hard to put this masterpiece together. Uh, doomed to repeat it. Please, everyone, watch it. And uh, let's ask God to bless our nation. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, God Jason. Bless Jason. <laughs> See you guys.